Caesar didn't let me. Like, well, no, you well, obey exactly. God rather than men, you know, that Acts 5 attitude. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Contra Talk. My name is Richard Henry, and this is the podcast where we talk about things that matter. We're talking to a guest today, Rich Tidwell. He's a husband and a father, and he is boots on the ground with uh, many different things that we're going to be touching on today, really just hands-on uh, dealing with homelessness and, and placement, foster care, and all the rest. It's a good conversation, or will be a good conversation. I hope you enjoy it. Tidwell, Rich, how you doing? I like your name. Welcome. Yeah, to Richard and Richard today. I, I, my father's also named Richard. We're all, Me too. We're all Richards here. <laughs> uh, and my great uncle. I love it. I love it. Yeah. I, yeah. Um, Welcome, I, I literally have the exact same name as my dad, which has created some issues in the past. Uh, I'm not a junior. Uh, you okay. Know? <laughs> so it's yeah. very interesting when you're dealing with the government and, uh, you know, various organizations. It's really just the social security number that separates us. So people oh, can get funny. confused. Yeah. <laughs> so it's the exact same name, but you're not a junior. That's funny. My <laughs> yeah, dad, exactly. yeah, our middle names are different. Uh, so I'm not a junior, but of course that doesn't stop people from, you know, growing up calling me junior. So yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. Chip off the old block. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, we met uh, on Twitter kind of loosely. I'm not sure how I'm not, I try to not spend too much time on Twitter, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think we all probably have that feeling, yeah. but you had posted some stuff and it was regarding uh, foster care and, and, and like homelessness and things like that. And I was like, man, this guy really, he knows what he's talking about. And I looked at a few more things and then we talked back and forth. I uh, know we've got you on the show. I want you to just tell us a little bit more who you are. Uh, you, your husband or father, father six. Uh, yep. Where are you? And uh, just briefly what you doing, doing with your ministry, how you came to Christ, that sort of thing. Yeah, well, thanks very much for having me on the show. Uh, my name is Rich Tidwell. Uh, you can find me and follow me on TikTok, for example. That's probably the biggest social media app that I'm on. Uh, and then YouTube as well. Also, uh, okay. I've been on YouTube for, I think, a decade, over a decade now. Um, I think I have a, a bit of a shadow ban on YouTube uh, from I think all I the do years too. of producing. I'm yeah. sure I do too, yeah. <laughs> all the years of producing content. TikTok, I have no ban. I think it's because the the Chinese uh, seem to want to know exactly what we think and what we're saying. So I don't get censored <laughs> there. But I am on the American social media. Yeah. Uh, and uh, also on Instagram and, and, and Twitter, as you mentioned. And I produce biblical content uh, online, really dive into any topic that's in the Bible. Uh, so I don't shy away from sex and marriage. I don't shy away from various doctrines that people regularly argue about, whether that be, uh, you know, sovereignty and free agency, what have you, a number of different topics uh, we'll dive into. And that's my ministry life online. Uh, in person, I pastor a church in uh, Holly Hill, Florida, um, Holly Hill slash Ormond Beach. So we're in Volusia County, Florida, and it's called Ormond Church. And I post all those sermons to YouTube and I post sermon clips to TikTok. And then I also create content specifically for those platforms. Um, and been doing that now uh, for many years. I mean, I've been a Christian for 20 years. Um, I started running a youth group when I was in high school because our church just simply didn't have one. So my dad, who is the pastor of the church, oversaw me, uh, but I was actually teaching at the Bible studies and all of that. And <clears throat> to give you just a little idea of who I was, you know, uh, back then I graduated in 2006. I'm 35 years old now. And uh, back then I would skip classes. I mean, I would sit in the class, but I'd just be reading my Bible. I was so amazed by what, what was rebel. in the scriptures. I know. I don't need <laughs> I, this public school nonsense. I'm going to go read the scripture. Especially now, I don't need their nonsense, you know. Oh, yeah, but for sure. but uh, even then. And so I would, for example, you know, I'd be paying attention. Like if this was like how to do a certain math equation or, or a historical class or what have you. Uh, English, I really excelled in because I really enjoyed English. But if it was like gym or some other kind of elective, you know, class, I usually was sitting in the corner reading my Bible <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> and That's trying to talk to people. I, yeah. I, I got bad grades more than once, not because I didn't care about school. I'd always do well in the classes I cared about, but I would sit there and I, I would read scripture. And I, I just would evangelize my friends all throughout high school. Yeah. Uh, we had a youth group that grew to about 60 kids uh, every Wednesday night. And we also started doing outreaches and events. 
And I worked for a missions organization called Christian Ventures International for five years. That gave me the opportunity to get into media. I traveled with them to Argentina. I was, um, you know, I went, I did missions to Mexico um, and not with them, but with a different organization, but when I was young. Um, and I learned how to film. Uh, I learned how to do audio and editing and all of that during that season of my life. Then I went into a little bit of secular work. Um, I worked for a local design agency in Daytona Beach. Uh, I was there for a little while, and then I actually was relieved of duty there. I was fired. Didn't make any sense. It was an interesting moment in my life. I was let go. I didn't understand why. All my clients were happy. I would work extra hours. There was really no reason to let me go. And then I realized it was spiritual. Mm -hmm. um, because at that point I started my own business and I was getting married. I literally got fired right before my wedding. It was the most bizarre Ooh. thing. Wow. It's like the worst time to, to get fired. <laughs> and yeah. And, uh, I started my own business. I started making websites for people, but during that is really when my YouTube channel started and the online ministry started and started to get into marketing, uh, learning social media marketing and how to, get your videos and content out there. And I was learning that through s doing my own projects and serving clients um, and just getting better at it. Of course, the playing field changed over time where certain topics and things started to get censored or shadow banned. Uh, and that was a very real reality. I mean, I saw the difference. I used to post YouTube videos that would easily get hundreds of thousands of views by wow. doing the right social media marketing. You know, you'd, you'd post a link on Reddit, you'd put the right tags in, you'd share yeah. it on Twitter, whatever, and it would explode. And it didn't matter what the topic was. And now you can do that exact same work and you'll get 200 views. I mean, it, it, it is wow. bizarre. And I think that's one of the reasons why they want to ban TikTok is because it's one of those last social media apps because it's, you know, managed by another country. It's one mm. of those last social media apps where there's not as much control here in the United States over, over what's being said. And so you're actually getting, I think, a more legitimate conversation on that app. And maybe now on Twitter as well, you know, after Musk purchased it. Yeah. So, you mm. know, entered into that space and while preaching, while being in ministry, uh, we started to do homeless ministry. My family um, started to serve the homeless on a street in Daytona Beach called North Street. There's quite a few homeless that spend their time there. That's kind of the hub. Most cities have a hub, a central point where you'll find a lot of homeless. And the reason why we started doing that is we really started to dive into scripture on loving your neighbor and what that really looks like, because what we had determined based on scripture and even Christian history is it was more than a handshake and a hug on a Sunday morning at church. You know, it, it, yeah. it had to be um, discomforting and personally challenging. I mean, Jesus says that we're supposed to take up our cross and follow him, that we're supposed to be crucified daily. And the typical church culture is not being crucified or or going out of their way um, for other people. For the most part, we're insulating and trying to live as comfortable of a life as possible. And if we're being honest, so true. <laughs> you, yeah, the the Good Samaritan story is very relevant for today's modern day, and I'm certain that it always has been. It's human nature, but that is that in the Good Samaritan story, you have somebody who's beat up in a ditch. And they are, it seems, on the brink of death. And Jesus mentions three parties that come in contact with this person. Two of them are religious elite or religious regulars. You know, yeah. uh, you have a priest and a Levite. You can't get more religious than that in Israel. Um, a priest and a Levite are there every time the temple is doing anything. That's their job that they're born into, that they must accomplish, um, they typically would know the Torah. They would know the law more than anybody else. You know, they'd be able to recite scripture to you more efficiently. These people were typically the experts in the law that you'll hear in the gospels. And interestingly enough, um, and this whole story is about loving thy neighbor. And interestingly enough, those two people pass by. Yeah. The religious elite, the people who are in church every time the doors are open, the people that, you know, have um, overall, I would say, a pretty moral life. You know, they, they likely are living fairly ethically. Uh, maybe they're having a sacrifice at the temple less than your average sinner, you know, during that time. 
And yet they commit this grievous sin because the royal law is to love God and to love neighbor or royal laws. And so you have, you know, love God with all your heart, soul, and strength uh, and all your mind, and then love your neighbor as yourself. And the Pharisee who's talking to Jesus during the story of the Good Samaritan says, and who is my neighbor? You know, that's how this story even comes up. And the priest and the Levite end up being the two that pass by. In other words, he's sending a message to that Pharisee who is also, you know, an expert in the law, a priest, um, that you likely identify with this group. In fact, we know that Jesus knew exactly who that person was and that they did identify. But this person claimed to love God and love neighbor, but they didn't really because when they saw somebody beat up in the ditch, they passed by and they did not assist with them. And there's a number of doctrines that might have permitted them to, to pass by in their own mind, not right. before God, but in their own mind. And, and some of those doctrines might have been that, well, I have duties at the church, right? So I've got to get to church on time. It might have been something more innocent like that. Uh, but it could have much more likely been something along the lines of you've brought this consequence upon yourself and deserve this punishment from God that you're receiving. Yeah. And you know what? They might even be right. I've, I've thought about this at length. You know, I've meditated on this passage at length because he's, he's talking about love of neighbor, which is supposed to be the greatest commandment. So we better pay attention to stories that relate to that. Mm-hmm. And when he's sharing this, I've thought about this. The, the, the man in the ditch, Jesus gives no detail on why he's in the ditch. Yeah. Does not tell us why, how he ended up there. And it's fair to consider that he's in the ditch because he did something wicked. Like, I just want to be clear yeah. because I, I'm relating this to the homeless just to circle back. You know, the homeless oftentimes are homeless from their own decisions. This is something you learn. Like, Yes, there are systemic issues. I'm not going to disregard those. That is real. Like there are systemic issues. There's even generational curses and issues on people where like your father was an alcoholic and you inherit alcoholism because you witnessed it all throughout your ch- childhood or or fatherlessness, which we'll talk about at length, I'm sure today. So yes, there's issues that are conditions surrounding a person that maybe they're born into, they have no control over. Absolutely. Um, however, Oftentimes what you'll find with the homeless is, no, they had a functioning family and they just started doing drugs and started to steal from them and they stole from them enough. They wanted nothing to do with them anymore. Yeah. Um, you know, that's a pretty common one. And, and so their own decisions might have gotten them into the ditch that they're in. OK, so in the story of the Good Samaritan, that could be the case. I, I would venture to say that most of the time that is the case. Some, sometimes a person is just attacked for no reason. I get that. Yeah. But sometimes it's because they literally, you know, this guy might have been a thief himself and he was getting what was coming to him and he stole from somebody else. And that guy hunted him down, beat him up, took his stuff back and left him in the ditch. So let's just say that was the situation. Maybe the priest and the Levite are correct. And that this guy totally deserves what came on him. Okay. Yeah. Jesus doesn't even address whether he deserves it or not. Yeah. Right. He does we, say, I will, I will say that it is, I think it's Luke 10. He does say he fell among robbers. So there is that context. But right. besides that, right. why was he robbed? Was he a robber himself? <laughs> That's I, what I, mean, I'm I, get, I get what you're saying. I'm not saying, like, oh, it's all trash. It's, it's possible that this guy, I yeah, fell agree. among robbers and himself was one, you know, like right. I just he left. He stole their stuff. Maybe he's a really <laughs> nice guy. You know, who knows? It yeah. These, yeah, these precise backgrounds about who this man is, we don't receive, but you're right. Yeah. He, he's, he's beat up by robbers. So it was bad guys that beat him up, but he could have been a bad guy. Right. And so, you know, they, they don't know they, but they do this, they see him beat up regardless of whatever the other factors are and they pass by. And that could be because, well, I'm so busy with my Christian life, or it could be something like, I don't want to get involved because maybe this is a dangerous situation and I've got a family and kids, you know, th- these are real thought processes humans have. Yeah. Uh, but they pass by and Jesus isn't pleased with that. So he uses them as the example of what not to do. And then you have a Samaritan. And um, in case the listeners don't understand, a Samaritan was typically uh, someone who recognized Jacob, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and believed in the same God, but did not worship God properly. They would worship him at, at, at high places. Uh, they would not worship him typically at the temple in Jerusalem. Right. So they were not practicing Judaism correctly. 
Um, and so the priests and the Levites and the Pharisee who's asking this question, they would regard the Samaritan as a heretic um, because of their improper worship. And so this is why a Samaritan is so important whenever a Samaritan is part of the story in the gospel. So good Samaritan is <laughs> comes by, sees the man in the ditch, and the doctrine that he does have right is love thy neighbor because as soon as he sees the man in the ditch, he doesn't consider the other factors. The only factor he considers is that this is a human being made in the image of God and they have inherent value. And so I'm going to do my best to assist them. Yeah. That doesn't mean I approve of whatever life they've been living. It just means that I recognize their value in the eyes of God. And as a fellow human being, love thy neighbor as thyself means if I was beat up, let's say I'm not a bad guy. I just was beat up and left in a ditch by robbers i would hope somebody would help me too i would hope that they would exactly. bind yeah. up my wounds and get me to the hospital or whatever service it is that i need especially if i'm unconscious and i can't care for myself so this man mm. does that he binds up his wounds he puts oil and wine on him puts him on his own donkey takes him to an inn okay and at the end he does something he goes above and beyond i believe this is what jesus was talking about when he said essentially to go the extra mile. If somebody asks you to go one mile, go with them two miles. He drops him off at the inn, and he also says, if he needs any additional care, I know I'm paraphrasing, if he needs any additional yeah. care, put it on my tab. You know, yeah. make Here's sure I will, I will pay it when I, <laughs> right, I will pay it when I get back. Here's my credit card. Exactly. So he literally is willing to take on like a debt on behalf of this man that he will pay for later, knowing that he can. Um, clearly he's some kind of businessman. Mm -hmm. based on the context. So we have the religious elite who are passing by. We have the people with the poor doctrine <laughs> who actually love their neighbors. And I believe there's a profound lesson there. And that is that at the end of the day, both of these groups, I will say, believed in the same God. So obviously that's an important topic when it comes to religion and, and discussion and making sure that people yeah. believe in the Messiah, you know, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. That's that's the key when it comes to, I would say, on the orthodox side of belief. You're not a Christian if you don't believe in Christ. Um, however, beyond that, the very first and greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. And the religious elite probably had better doctrine overall, but they were failing in love thy neighbor. And it was such a grievous failure that Jesus applauds a heretic over mm. these people who had the better doctrine. And he says, this guy, I'm wow. way more pleased with this guy because he loved his neighbor. Yeah. And as I saw that, that really started to move me, especially in the high school days of, okay, we've got to help people regardless of what their background is. Mm. And we need to start making sure that we don't pass by in the name of, I don't know, our orthodoxy. I don't know, yeah. busyness, whatever our reasons are. It doesn't really matter. We cannot pass by. All my other doctrines are meaningless if I don't love my neighbor. Yeah. Right. Because Jesus said, like, they will know you're my disciples because of your love. And so if I don't have that, I'm I'm not walking in love. Yeah. And and love is really defined even. I mean, it's defined throughout Scripture and we can talk about that, you know, even at length. But love is really defined even in that one parable. Love your neighbor as yourself. OK, if I was in this situation, how would I want to be treated? OK, right. I need to treat my neighbor exactly that way and do that for them. So we started doing homeless ministry as a result of that, because these people are the people in the ditch and they might be in the ditch because of drug use and alcoholism and because they're dangerous and violent and what have you. Nevertheless, the priest passed by and we shouldn't be passing by. Yeah. And another way of thinking of passing by is just indifference. Um, people tend to think, well, I don't hate my neighbor. And they apply a definition that's unbiblical to hate. They think hate has to be this rage and anger and I'm going to punch you in the face and a real aggressive. Right. Biblical hate is indifference. It's passing by. So the priest and the Levite hated their neighbor and the Good Samaritan loved their neighbor. That's the difference. Those are the two. That's the yeah. spectrum, love and hate. And so well, there's, we there's just, oh, go on, go on. no, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was just going to say with hate too, we'll see that. I mean, even with Jacob, I loved Esau, I hated, or yeah. you have to hate your parents uh, and that yeah. sort of thing. And it's like, well, this is talking about preference over one over the other, not right. that God right. utterly despises or we must no. utterly despise 
and and seek out vengeance and absolutely our own parents demise and it's like you know you're supposed to honor your parents so obviously right. if you take this route that's a contradiction christ right. is wrong here so clearly right. that's not what it means when he says you exactly. gotta hate your hate your this do that um but yeah there's there's that level of uh of, of preference, which I think sometimes people will go to the extreme, especially on the more left side, uh, where they'll they'll love the refugee, you know, they'll love the homeless person, but they won't they won't love well the one in the womb, or they won't love their right. own family, or they won't you know they'll see their cousin who's you know fundamentalist you know blah 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 blah, blah King James only whatever, but he's on hard time, <laughs> and it's like well he's he's a fundy like I can't help him. Right. I'm going to help the guy down the road because, you know, he's got he's got syphilis and this and this and this. And he's really on hard times and he's at the shelter all the time. I'm going to help. Right. That's my neighbor. And it's like, what about your cousin, though? Like, he's your neighbor, too. Right. Like, you well, know, and, and to call their bluff in that scenario, typically speaking, they're yeah, they're they're vocally advocating for the homeless. Uh, but they're usually just entrusting their tax dollars to go to the homeless. They're not actually yeah. usually very hands-on. Mm -hmm. That person who won't help their fundy neighbor yeah. also usually isn't actually helping their homeless neighbor. <laughs> I just want to interject that, that they're, yeah, yeah, no, they're, us they're usually all talk, which is true from both sides of the spectrum. There's usually a lot of only verbal. I, I see a lot of orthodoxy, um, what people consider. Orth obviously, there's Christian orthodoxy, but even like liberal orthodoxy. And then orthopraxy is a whole different realm. You know, people don't usually practice right. what they're believing so sorry go, go ahead no 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 that's it i mean that's good i mean i i like that um that's a good summary i love that sharing with the good samaritan because sometimes i mean there's you know samaritan ministry and samaritan's purse and you know oh be a good samaritan i mean that's right. in our vernacular um and it's and it's something that you know whether you're on the left or the right uh theologically <laughs> Uh, not you, but just in general, like yeah. people will make distinctions, you know, where it's, oh, you're, you're, you don't want to help those people over there in Africa and the AIDS, this and the refugee that. And it's like, yeah, but you're fine with killing babies, you know? And then yeah. likewise, there's people right. that are like, oh, and, and abortion. I, I but just, there's yeah. other stuff that's like, well, but this lady needs a handout. And it's like, well, she deserves it, you know? And it's like, right. well, uh, but she's also got a kid. Well, the kid's born, we're good. And it's like, well, no, we should probably still help them. You know, m maybe not forever, but like, let's help her and like counsel her and get her in a good spot. She's in a, an abusive relationship or, you know, whatever. And, yeah. you know, everybody does different, different levels of that, but we can all uh, take a dose of our own medicine of love thy neighbor and really examine what that looks like. Yeah. Well, and sure, so. I, something I've noted uh, among folks, because I just had this conversation. I, I had commented on a post where a person was advocating for abortion. It was supposed to be a, a self-defense page, you know, like protecting women uh, yeah. from aggression. And I was like, okay, how disingenuous is it to be a page that promotes protecting women from aggression, like rape or attacks or what have you, how to be yeah. safe, you know, set up cameras at your house, that sort of thing. Uh, carry a, maybe even carry a concealed firearm, that, that sort of thing, learn self-defense, whatever. So it's that kind of page. And then they're like, oh yeah, we're pro-choice. You know, I, I, I had to murder my baby for this reason and that reason and all that. And I'm thinking, yeah. how disingenuous and inconsistent is it that you are wanting to protect these born women, these living women, but not the weakest of neighbors in the womb. And so something I've noted, the devil is typically at work if a person's ideology is inconsistent, then there's probably Satan at work. And I yeah. mean this for religious and non-religious, but look for consistency. So you can read the entire scriptures, right? Protestant Bible from Genesis to Revelation, 66 books, you know, over 40 authors. You can read that whole work and find that it's always consistent. I have not found a single real contradiction. There's yeah. surface level appearance contradictions, but there's like no hating. real. <laughs> yeah, like hating. Yeah. yeah, like what's the context? Right, right. Uh, uh, so, you, you know, you you have this consistency in scripture, the supernatural. And then and then you go back and, you know, you you, for example, you have the Old Testament and you go back and you find the Dead Sea Scrolls and, oh my goodness, the Old Testament of today and the Old Testament of 2000 years ago aligns like yeah. we've kept it accurate. How did that even happen? That's supernatural that that sort of care and meticulousness would even be carried out on a translation for that long in multiple different languages. And you go back and you go, wow, look at this. The Dead Sea Scrolls in the Qumran Caves was exactly accurate. So 
I find a lot of inconsistencies in these belief systems that people promote. So this person comments and they go, well, uh, you know, you're you're uh, pro violence because you're pro gun. You know, you're you're happy to uh, have guns. And I'm like, buddy, listen, I'm trying to explain to you. I want to protect the life of the unborn from the violent and I want to protect my own family from the violent. Yeah. And I will use violence like in a home invasion to protect them. That is that's this is another conversation here, but that is love of neighbor as well yeah. is to provide for and to protect individuals. So it is charity. It's charitable giving, but it's also protection and, and provision. So to circle back to the helping the homeless, we are helping the homeless. Um, and what we learned from the homeless was that the family unit of the homeless breaks down. You know, maybe they steal from them all the time. Maybe people die or what have you. So a lot of homeless, when you get to know them, are adult orphans is mm-hmm. how I would uh, oh. label it. They're like adult orphans. They're fatherless. Maybe they have been. So some homeless we would meet, a decent amount actually, were um, in foster care when they were children. So that already tells you that there was a yeah. level of dysfunction in the family. But wow. they're definitely orphans now because oftentimes they've been disowned uh, or their parents are, are passed away, especially for the adults chronically homeless. Yeah. So we started to seek God. Well, how do we help to break this cycle from them even getting to the street in the first place? Because the street is really rough. It sucks you in. And it has a way of gripping you. It's very demonic out there. Mm. Um, People get into a lot of evil, most of the time just to survive. So a lot of the women are prostitutes, honestly, just to survive or to pay for the kids that they have or or what have you. Um, I see why Jesus had compassion on prostitutes once I started interacting with them. uh, Because I realized, okay, you do have legitimate reasons why you're doing this it is it is wickedness i'm not approving i'm just saying you have legitimate reasons why and that's why we need to help you get out because there are other options um i know a ministry even locally that got started and and that was their whole uh mission was literally to to take prostitutes and ex-convicts and give them a house and help rehab them into normal society so that they could meet their children's needs or, or you know, provide for their family or what have you uh, yeah. and not have to use prostitution. So I see why yeah. Jesus was compassionate towards prostitutes. There's one in Louisville repeatedly. too. Like yeah. That, that they, yeah. They, it was particularly, um, what's the, I don't know, strippers. I can't remember like the, yes. the, the, the correct word. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the PC words, but yeah, women of the night. Uh, yeah. And they have like a couple bakeries and some other things and some houses and Praise God. transitioning sort of thing. So really, really cool. Yeah. And so from that, uh, we felt called specifically to start serving children who are aging out of foster care, which is something that I didn't even realize existed. And aging out of foster care is when a child who's a legal adult or a, a legal minor at 17 turns 18 and on their 18th birthday, they age out that day. They leave child welfare that day. Yeah. Uh, and while most states usually have some sort of system in place uh, to help them transition into adulthood, usually it would be called like an independent living program or something like that. Uh, oftentimes they fail um, to either take advantage of the opportunity or if they do, they fail to maintain their residency. So let's say they age out, they're 18 years old, and there's some sort of apartment that they can go to that the government has a deal with and they help pay their rent for it. That's independent living. Um, they will not know how to comply with the apartment's rules and regulations because they've never had to self-regulate ever Mm -hmm. since they've been in foster care. And so they're usually at the maturity level, even if they're 18, if they've had trauma, uh, they could be at the maturity level from anywhere from like 12 to 16 years old. I mean, you're, you might have a legal adult, but you're dealing with an emotional and, and mental child. They're adults. I mean, it's not like the government can come in and swoop in and save them. They're not minors anymore. So uh, they can receive some help and benefits, but it usually doesn't work. And the missing factor was a trustworthy Christian adult mentoring them and providing housing during that mentorship. Because there's all these other services. It's like if you want to get a foster care, uh, foster kid uh, food, there's usually something. If you need to get them money, there's usually something. If you need to get them psychiatric care, there's usually something. They always qualify for here in Florida. 
uh, Medicaid. You know, they have free health care. Uh, they can even this is amazing. And it actually is a wonderful uh, opportunity for them. <clears throat> but in the state of Florida, most states in the United States, a child who's aged out of foster care can go to a, any four year state college for free. And mm -hmm. so they could, yeah. for example, we got a state college here in Daytona Beach. Uh, Daytona State College, it's called. And they have a mechanics program, for example, like a specific skilled trade. They have a number of those. You can go to that for free and you can wow. become a mechanic yeah. and a mechanic makes a good living. You know, uh, the problem is they don't have any support base um, or, you know, self-motivation um, to go and take advantage of these things. And even if they do, so let's say they're a pretty industrious young adult and they really are eager to work hard. Um, if you don't have your residential situation squared away, try try and maintain like school or a job without a bed to sleep in, yeah. without stability on like being able to groom yourself, to being able to have a, a nice place for your clothing to sit so that it's clean and fresh when you put it on to, to go to work. So a lot of these normal things that we experience in life, um, if, if you didn't grow up in poverty, uh, are lacking from children who are aging out of foster care. So here's what happens statistically to them is they age out of foster care and they 20% of them are immediately homeless in the sense of sleeping on park benches on the street. 20%, mm -hmm. I mean, that's huge. Like you, you, you're talking about, fine, you yeah. know, yeah, thousands of kids. Um, and, and so you have, you have 25,000 that are aging out annually in the United States. So about 5,000 are immediately homeless. And a wow. huge percentage of that is Florida. So we have uh, a large amount of children aging out of care here. We have a lot of foster kids here. Um, and I, I believe that might just be because we're a fairly transient state. So people come here on vacations or just to try and make a way here. And, and if they don't, they end up in that homelessness cycle. And so we have a lot of transients in Florida. It's a beautiful state too. The weather's amazing. Like if you have to live outdoors, uh, it's better than living in like a cold, snowy environment. I think that's yeah. why people come here as well. Sure. So these children are aging out. 20% are homeless, you know, on their 18th birthday. But the rest of them start to become homeless as well. They they will, uh, we call it couch surfing. They'll sleep on people's couches of maybe foster parents they knew or this person they knew or family members or what have you. That situation doesn't work out for one reason or another, uh, usually because they don't know how to amicably and peaceably live with another human being in their house. They usually have a problem with authority. Mm. Um, and so if somebody has rules in their house, it's the same reason why they get kicked out of the state apartments, they get kicked out of other people's houses. I mean, you know, even in my home, you know, we, when we've uh, taken in foster youth, whether it's a legacy house or not, which I'm getting to legacy house. I was um, going to ask you, yeah, what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, that, uh, you know, it, it, they still have to comply to a, a system of rules, you know, a, yeah. as you're helping them. I can't have you doing heroin in my living room or, or right. anywhere near my children. Like, it's yeah. just not going to happen, you know. So, OK, so we started to see that demographic, see the problem that they were facing. And the Lord called us to it. And he called us to it with a very specific scripture. And I'll, I'll read it real quick. It's James 127. And this is the one that the Holy Spirit just really highlighted and said, you're going to do this. And I believe that this command is actually for all Christians in some way, shape or form, because it, it applies to everybody, as, as you know. James 1.27 says, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. And uh, that's the NASB 1995, if you're wondering. And what's being stated there is that Anything less than religion, Christian religion, that serves the orphan and the widow. So some of the, in scripture, some of those who are at the greatest disadvantage in life, usually due to genuine systemic issues. Um, mm -hmm. The widow does not have a husband and provider, uh, and there, there just may not be enough communal support to ensure that she and her X amount of children are able to survive. And I've seen that repeatedly. Yeah. Um, where that demographic has a hard time. And then, of course, the fatherless or the, the orphan. 
Um, not having parents is so fundamental to our success in life that when we don't have it, our chances of not succeeding skyrocket. And so, of course, the scriptures say that these two groups are in distress and we're supposed to look after these groups that are in distress. They're at an economic disadvantage and they might even be at an intellectual disadvantage if they didn't receive proper education. And so we're supposed to dive in. Well, what does that look like? Well, love your neighbor as yourself. Good Samaritan, as we were talking about earlier, provide for their needs. And if you notice in the story of the Good Samaritan, part of providing for the man's needs was meeting his emergency needs immediately. But he mm -hmm. also did provide shelter for him. I mean, he took him to an inn, put a roof over his head, put him in a bed. Right. Okay. So clearly residential care is part of love thy neighbor. So God told us, hey, I want you to start housing children who are aging out of foster care. And I started to go and look for other programs that were doing this and found very few. I found a couple of homes. I found one in Texas that had opened and closed. Um, this was just not common because similar to the unborn crisis where Christians will get real concerned about the child in the womb, uh, but then a much smaller percentage is concerned about after the womb. And that is true. I mean, we, we can see it in the foster care statistics. There are typically 400,000 children in foster care in the United States. And the problem is that most of them don't get fostered or adopted. So they end up in group homes, they end up aging out. And the problem ultimately is that Christians aren't answering the call. And the reason I know that is because we typically have about that many uh, Christian churches. So you could call it evangelical or just Christian. Yeah. If you want to lump in everybody, Catholics, Orthodox, Protestants, Anglicans, the whole big group. So just say Christian, we have enough churches to provide a home for every single one of those children. So a foster family or adopt, and we're not doing it. So yeah. if one family from every church in the United States adopted or fostered, there would be no foster care crisis. That is genuine statistical wow. data yeah so what that reveals is that mm. we're not we're we're guilty of what we hear the unbeliever or the leftists say and 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 that is that they verbally care about a situation but they don't really follow through on it personally and we've got to watch out that we don't become guilty of that that we're verbally concerned and voting for the unborn which i'm all about legislating and abolishing abortion but we yeah. are uh, failing to foster and adopt the child that didn't get aborted. And this is a real situation that we need to address as believers. Mm. And so we saw the group that didn't get adopted, didn't get fostered, aging out, becoming homeless and becoming the chronic homeless that we were working with. And we said, hey, the Lord told us, hey, you've got to start providing housing for them. So we dove in. We didn't know anybody who was doing it. Uh, this was seven years ago now. And we just started to put the word out there. And this is how I, everything I shared, it kind of comes full circle. God utilized the ministry and the marketing to start this. So I want to encourage you if you're listening and you're like, I don't really have the skill set to be able to do this or to change the world or what have you. Yes, you do. Like your individual skill set that God has given you is going to apply to whatever ministry it is you do. Like Paul was a tent maker. And as he entered ministry full time for the Lord, he would tent make with uh, like Priscilla and Aquila and, and, and others. He would tent make with other people and that would provide his needs. That would help fund his ministry. Uh, I'm sure that was even something that he could mentor other believers and help them with a, a skill set that they could learn. So absolutely, you can learn about the Bible. You can learn an earthly skill. And then those two things come together. And how it came together for me was, I just started marketing this problem and that we wanted to start providing housing. We planted a church uh, separate from my dad, a sister church. We planted our own church and I started pastoring. Uh, in 2014, we started kind of privately a house church and then we were became public in 2015. And the first house was planted early 2016. And that wow. just came from marketing and telling people what we were going to do and just sharing about the problem and the solution and how the solution that's missing is not all these wraparound projects. There's usually all kinds of subsidized care that we could give them access to. What was missing was the housing specifically. There was not residential housing. So we started doing that. The Good Samaritan, we're going to bounded you up. We're going to give you a house and we're going to help you get on your feet. And then we're going to help you graduate into your own independent living. And we started that seven years ago and we started taking in children who were aging out of care. 
sometimes this looks like 16 or 17 year olds. Um, typically it's 17 for us now. Um, because with that, we can do what's called a non-relative caregiver, which means you don't have to go through the entire licensing process. Um, and that protects you because if you have 18 or 19 year olds who have aged out and they have a juvenile record, the state will then take out the minor from the house. Yeah. Uh, but if they're on a, um, non-relative caregiver, then they will not take the minor out of the house, especially if they're 17, about to become 18. And so you're able to help both at the same time. So you might have 18 or 19 year olds here who are legal adults who have a juvenile record and you can still help that 17 year old minor literally on their birthday have a home when they age out. And so we start taking in these guys, 17, young 20s. Um, and we put them in school immediately. So we give them a home. We put them in school immediately. If they haven't completed high school, which is super common, we make sure that they either complete whatever school they are going to, or if they can't because it's too far away, we'll have them go through a GED program, get their GED, make sure that they have that high school level education done. Yeah. Then they, I mentioned this earlier, they have a free ride at a state college. So we will put them into a local state college. They select what they want to be learning, all of that, and they can go that to that school for free and learn some kind of trade skill or even business or what have you. Um, and then during that time, they can live with us. So that could be two to four years easily. So this is a long discipleship program. This isn't like we fed you a meal at Christmas time and we felt so good about it. And then we just, we'll see you next year. Like right. I, I, I saw so much charitable work like that, that it really started to put a bad taste in my mouth because human beings, First off, they eat three times a day, not just once. And secondly, right. they eat every day, 365 days a yeah, year. Even if it's so one it's meal like... a day, that's still 364 <laughs> other meals. Right. So and most of know, us eat more than once. Yeah. Right. So I, while I, I totally support that, that connection point where a person first starts helping people and it's like they went to a soup kitchen for a day and they they got a touch with the the homeless and loving their neighbor. I think that that's wonderful. Um, so I don't want to downplay that too much, but if that becomes like your whole Christian life, like that's your practice of Christianity. It's like at Christmas, I helped, you know, feed the poor. It's like, yeah, guys, that's great. That's wonderful. I believe the Holy Spirit's idea with that is that you get in contact with these people. And then at Christmas time, because you're motivated because of the Christmas season that you go and start doing it regularly, you know? Yeah. So, uh, they'll live with us yeah, for two to four years a year or whatever. Yeah. Right. Right. That they'll uh, live with us two to four years during high school, and then when they've or during college, and then when they've graduated, uh, that we will have a graduation period, which is usually about six months, where they uh, get their affairs in order to be able to move into their own place. And we've had multiple successful graduations um, at our now two homes. We have two homes that Legacy Housing specifically oversees. And then we have a network of homes. We have a home in Texas that's part of our network called Our Daughter's House. So we're Legacy Housing. And then they're part of the Legacy Housing Network called Our Daughter's House. And I sit on the board for that home and, and am part of the governance of the home. But they're, they're separate 501c3 and we help to support them. Um, uh, one, with the policies and counseling and experience that we have. But two, we'll approach national grants and disperse those funds to all the homes. So if you give to legacy housing, that's going to typically go to the homes that we control. Mm -hmm. um, but if you specify it's for the network, it'll go to all the homes. And then when it comes to grants, grants go to all the homes. So that's that's how that networking process works. We do not receive any funding from our network homes. Um, we simply just uh, help them and assist them, make sure that their homes actually succeed because this is hard work. And we yeah. do believe biblically that this needs to be done. It's so we do not franchise uh, as far as like, we don't play in homes and you pay us from what you fundraise. No, you're your own organization. We just help run it. And then we approach grants together. And that's how uh, we support all of the homes. So each home does its own local fundraising and then we do national grants together. Okay. So yeah. we have a home in uh, two homes now in Florida. We have one, uh, two in Volusia County, and then we have one in Texas and then one in Missouri. And we may have another partner home uh, that'll be joining us, a network home in Jacksonville. So we could have three in Florida uh, here pretty soon. And our goal at, at Legacy Housing is to actually be the largest organization in the United States eventually that is providing housing for children who are aging out of foster care. And our mission statement specifically is that we prevent youth homelessness by providing uh, youth homelessness and sex trafficking by providing free quality housing for at-risk aged out foster youth. And mm -hmm. our goal is to provide a home 
for every one of the 25,000 children who are aging out of care. So you can learn more about Legacy and what we've been doing for the last seven years at LegacyHousingProject.org. And again, you can also connect with me online. So with that, Richard, I'd be totally happy to talk about anything really at this point about legacy, yeah. about serving the orphan, even about the connections to the unborn and the homeless, uh, wherever you'd like to go with this thing, but just super grateful to be on and, and sorry for the long explanation of, uh, you know, oh, how no, we no. got to I mean, what we're doing. <laughs> it's good. I mean, it's, it's, you know, you kind of parachute in with somebody and I have, you know, a variety of people on and sometimes people will know this guy or that guy or this gal or yeah. whatever. And, other people is like, I have no idea what this is. And they don't. And yes. <laughs> I hope, you know, at least with conversations like this uh, and the channel in general and just producing stuff is getting people thinking, challenging people. I mean, that's the whole contramundum being against it, but for it. And yeah. And even within the church, because I think the problem a lot of times we see. There's a both and I'd say in the last probably 100, 120 years with I mean, orphans, uh, homelessness food pantries, soup kitchens, uh, uh, all these things, it was a lot easier 120, 150 years ago, you know, and there was a lot more cohesion as far, I, I think, I mean, maybe I'm naive, but I, I pay attention to history. I try to, and there's certain, there's so much now regulation with everything that's like, well, you yeah. can't, you can't just open up your church kitchen. You need to have the, the, the food, uh, the health department come in and you need to do this. And you, every so often, and if you want to give food away, but yeah, and you can't, and now it's this, and it's like, I just want to, I just want to make a meal for Thanksgiving, you know, like that so type I, of thing. It's, yeah. it's local regulation, depending on where you are, especially from California, yeah. where we are, we yeah. had to have all sorts of things that I'd asked more than one about like, Hey, we got this, I mean, an open line, huge mixer, huge food table, giant dish pit, a couple ovens. Like, why don't we like open this up and do some food? you know, for the homeless, do like a once a week thing, a Bible study, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, ah, well, we can't this, you'd have to do that. And in, in the city of Burbank, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, oh. like so I just, yeah, I, I might be able to offer some like advice, that. especially if we have other ministers that are listening um, yeah. in on the podcast, which I imagine we are, especially with this kind of topic. Um, so um, we've learned quite a bit on the legal end over the last seven years, because fundamentally, if God tells you do this, like James 127, is not even one of those, like I was struck with lightning and an angel right. appeared to me. And so, you know what I'm saying? Like it's right it's there exactly. verbatim. It is written. Look yeah. after orphans, widows in their distress. Either you are, or you aren't. And you're not going to be able to tell me, well, Caesar didn't let me like, well, no, you well, obey exactly. God rather than men, yeah. you know, that acts five attitude. Um, you know, we must obey God rather than human beings, you know? Yeah. And so we dove in with that and, and we've run into our fair share of, you know, there's zoning issues. There's um, zoning's usually the primary issue you're going to run into. And then there's also just neighbors and, and what have you, you know, people who are concerned. And right. So here's a few things that we've learned along the way. Uh, the first one that would apply that the Catholics and Orthodox utilize regularly that us Protestants need to figure out um, <laughs> is something called the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act. OK, that's the uh -huh. very specific name. You okay. can Google that. Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act. OK, so what does this act do? Well, this is a federal law. And what it does is it bolsters your right to practice your religion, right? So we already mm -hmm. know that that's written into our Constitution and Bill of Rights that, you know, the government will not prohibit the practice of, of religion uh, in the state, uh, no matter what state. So anywhere in the right. United States. Okay, so can't prohibit. Okay, so I can prove to you a scripture, not just 127, uh, James 127, that we have to look after orphans. I mean, we have to. Um, I can prove that we're supposed to give residential care through stories like the Good Samaritan, among others, you know, mm -hmm. like we like you could even go all the way back to Lot in Sodom. It's like he, he, he knew biblically he had to take in those men of God. He, I don't know if he realized they were angels yet, but those men of God that had entered the city, mm -hmm. um, he took them into his home. These are my guests, you know, even though the city was like, uh, you know, give us those men. We want to have sex with them. He was like, no, they're my guests. Like he was resisting the authority of that city uh, is some, uh, very interesting. And then, of course, you have the Hebrew midwives all the way back in Exodus who just refused to kill babies and yeah. just refused. And God specifically uh, applauded them and gave them uh, descendants as a result of their yeah. bravery. So there's multiple times where you've got like resisting the government. That's just a few. I mean, Daniel, 
you know, Daniel's told, oh, you can't pray for 30 days, you know, mask up, vax up, and we got to slow this spread, you know, and he's like, I am gonna pray yeah. during these 30 days and you will not stop me. And yeah, sometimes it results in the lion's den. Like this is one area where as believers and especially as ministers of the gospel, we need to understand that like the ministers who've come before us have been crucified upside down, beheaded, thrown in lion's dens, thrown into fiery furnaces. And half the time it's because they disobeyed Caesar or whatever government was in power at that time. So the, the government we are to submit to, Romans 13, so long as that government is behaving righteously. But as soon as they are in rebellion to God, we always obey God. Now, yeah. we want to do things rightly and legally, okay? So I'm sharing that just as a fundamental, we obey God rather than human beings. But, but even Paul, up until the time that he was actually beheaded in Rome, would utilize the fact that he was a Roman citizen and would literally invoke Roman law. Yeah. So that's yeah. where I'm coming up with the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act. Okay, so we have biblical law that's commanding it. We have an ideology that says obey God rather than human beings, including high priests, kings, and all those who are in authority if they're in rebellion to God. Um, and so, like, for example, like China says, oh, you can only have this many babies, and so you have to abort them after that. I mean, if, like, if America ever did that, like, I'm still having babies. You're not yeah. – stop. so that attitude, okay. But – how do we do it lawfully if we can? Well, what the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act does is it enables the Christian church or Christians to practice their faith and not pre be prevented by zoning regulations or mm. other uh, local codes, you know, county codes, or even state codes. So what does that mean? It means, and I'll use it in the Catholic or the Orthodox um, use so that we understand how they've utilized it. But if you study case law, what they have done is they say, okay, we'd like to open a convent in this neighborhood. A convent is going to have a chapel. It might even have something like a store where the ladies are specifically, or let's say it's a monastery, the monks or the ladies are, are working on something. Like monks oftentimes super frequently produce alcohol at their monasteries. Yeah. Like that's that's pretty that's common. Like we make mead point, yeah. here, you know? Yeah. And and so they'll be uh, they'll have faith, uh, a faith based like chapel, and then they'll have some sort of secular job that they're doing to help raise funds for the monastery. And then, of course, they're providing housing. And then on top of that, it's pretty common for a monastery to take a person in, um, even if they're not desiring to be a monk. So, like, let's say you just experienced a cataclysmic financial event in your life. Um, you know, your let's say like you're, it's really bad. Like your, your wife died, you, you, you know, something like that. And you've lost your job and you're in a really rough shape. You could show up in a monastery and typically speaking, they will take you in without requiring you to actually become a monk. And you can usually live there for upwards of 12 months. And I know this isn't as common among Protestants, but this historically is common among Catholicism and Orthodoxy. Um, and uh, well, I guess Protestants have had some level of monasteries in the past, but modern Protestants do not. Right. And so you can take people in. So what do you see at a monastery or convent? Well, you see you have housing, residential care. You have, you know, church related activities like the chapel. And then you literally have business activities where they usually have a gift shop and other things where you can buy items that the monks or the, the nuns made. OK, so you can imagine all the coding violations that kick in there, right? One of the first ones is that there's too many unrelated adults living together. So almost all zoning in all cities is going to have a maximum number of unrelated adults. And the exceptions are usually if um, are unrelated humans in a house. The exceptions usually are adoption, foster care, adult uh, home care facilities like elderly homes, what have you. So there's oh, okay. usually some stuff written in. Yeah. But in general, like if I was like, you know what, I'm going to take in 10 homeless people to my house. Your zoning is going to say, oh, no, you're not. Or if your yeah. church did that too, well, we're going to have the church, you know, house some homeless, which I fundamentally agree with doing. Um, how do we actually do that without them shutting us down? Well, they're going to say, yeah, we have the right to shut you down. And they, they might even fine or what have you. But if you approach them in advance and you present to the Religious Land Use Institutionalized Persons Act, especially if you do so with an attorney who mediates with your city or county attorney, um, they usually can reach a mediation and recognize, OK, you guys are allowed to do this because mm. what you're allowed to do as a city government or a county government is require fire extinguishers, smoke alarms, 
exits, okay. these kinds yeah. of things. You cannot federally prevent the practice itself. So if I can mm -hmm. prove with the scriptures that I'm to take in orphans, which I am, you cannot federally at the federal level, which then, of course, controls the, the state and county levels um, if they're going to be constitutional. You cannot prevent me from taking in. You cannot say, well, sure, you can help orphans, but you can only help two. The government doesn't have the right to actually make that case. Yeah. So they cannot prevent you. So this is why a monastery could have 15 monks and five people that are recovering from trauma or what have you and sell and have a chapel all on mm. one side. It's like, how did that happen? No, it's, it's not just because it got grandfathered. Even the new ones that they build, they're usually doing religious land use. And if your county um, is really authoritarian, you, you might actually have to have a court case. And I, there's, I mean, that's why there's so much case law, like the Catholics and Orthodox have had court cases to do this. Uh, but oftentimes they are actually going to simply provide you with the exception because wow. they don't want that legal fight. And there's plenty of case law that says you will win. So the law actually is very strong in favor of religion. So verbally and locally authorities might be like, no, you can't do this. But law is actually what governs the United States. Right. And so if you just like Paul invoke Roman law, if you invoke American law, you will win. So on the practical side, if you wanted to start your own home, as we were talking about, the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act gives you a lot of leeway, as long as this is a faith-based organization, uh, yeah. because you are ultimately fulfilling a very clear, both scripture and historic precedent is set that the church provides housing for orphans and for people who are in need. So this is not something new. And with that, you're given the ability to really do what you want. You can buy property. You can house uh, children who are aging out of care um, without being prevented by local zoning regulations, because that's usually people's first issue is, you know, you're going to have neighbors or other people who are going to say, oh, well, you're, you can't do that here. And even on the books, it might say, no, you can't do that here. And that's kind of the point of the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act is when you invoke it and you discuss it with the city attorney, with your own attorney, typically, uh, you're going to be able to receive an exception and, yeah. and be able to do it. And if they actually litigated, you have proof over and over again the Catholics and the Orthodox that you do win in court and the city does have to actually obey the law and permit you to, to practice your faith, which includes mm -hmm. housing orphans or homeless or what have you. Churches can do this too. Um, like you mentioned, if a church has a soup kitchen and they really want to take in the homeless, you know, they, they want to maybe house them. I know a church that would house the homeless in the sanctuary during the week during non-use, and then they would clean it up and all of that. There were still rules, you know, obviously the church regulates how that's going to be done, but ultimately they were providing housing and clothing and helping them get on their feet. It was great. They were, they were more efficient than any state shelter that I've seen so far, you know, and they utilize the same thing. Hey, look, this is, this is in compliance with the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act. And so the Protestants have utilized it as well. Um, now, also, um, you know, let's say you're on the religious end, you want to play in a church, you want to do some good works. Um, most of the time people form as 501c3s because it's the IRS designation for a nonprofit. But they don't realize, and it's an antiquated law, but it's still law. Like it's unconventional, It's just, uh, uh, but it's still legal and fully recognized by the IRS. Uh, a church is its own designation, and a church is automatically tax exempt. So if you go to yeah. IRS code 508C1A, a church is automatically tax exempt and a church's integrated auxiliaries are automatically tax exempt. Mm. So for legacy housing, what we've done, this is kind of the nuts and bolts of how we've done this. Uh, the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act ensures that no matter where we plant one, we're going to be able to operate just like a monastery can exist wherever they want. That's why you'll find them in the country, but you also find them in the city. Um, and then the structure of our organization, you don't have to exactly do it this way, but I just want to share, like, I feel like this is knowledge that many Christians would benefit from, especially those who are yeah. leaders of organizations or planting to plant a church or start a charity or what have you. Okay. So you can start what's called an unincorporated church. The IRS recognizes this. A church is just a church. It's not a corporation. It's its own entity. Mm -hmm. And then your state usually will have some kind of guidelines for unincorporated. Not a whole lot. There won't be. Don't expect a lot on the books about this, but it does usually exist. And there's precedent for it. Um, 
all churches before the modern day IRS code were unincorporated. They were just churches. There, there right. was no corporate documents. Okay, so you can literally create a constitution and bylaws, same way this country is run on a constitution, a constitution and bylaws, which is your legal document that declares you exist as a church. You do not incorporate. You're not bound to the anti-discrimination laws and other things that might be a problem. Like th this is real. Like if you found a church, you start a church and you refuse to hire a homosexual as a priest, right? Let's say one applies and they can prove in a court of law that you discriminated based on their being a homosexual uh, or anything like pro-abortion woman or whatever. And you're like, no, we're not doing that here. It, it doesn't really occurred yet, but the truth is they want to do this and they will. I think things will get more legal. They could technically apply all the anti-discrimination laws that are tied to a corporation, faith-based or not, at the end of the day, uh, typically, and I've talked to lawyers about this, the law about corporations will apply to a church. And so it really is up in the air whether a judge will rule in your favor or against you. So how do you stay out of that? Well, you can be unincorporated. You can literally be a unincorporated church. And then the IRS recognizes you as a church and gives you a special exemption where you are, it says literally, you're automatically a uh, tax exempt according to 501c3 and all your integrated auxiliaries are also uh, considered tax exempt. So uh -huh. legacy housing is an integrated auxiliary of Ormond Church. Ormond Church is an unincorporated church, has a constitution and bylaws, but is unincorporated. And then legacy housing is a nonprofit association that filed with the IRS and uh, filed also for an integrated auxiliary status which means that you do not have to file Form 990. So you can still be transparent with all of your donors, but you don't have to be at risk of getting fined by the IRS. You are not under the anti-discrimination laws. You are really insulated and protected. And I believe that this information I'm sharing, I believe just like you know, God gives inspiration and understanding of scripture, that God helped us to navigate this so that we, especially as across the country, because legacy housing plans to be in multiple states, as we've been doing, um, are fairly insulated and protected from attacks from maybe areas that are more on the left side of the spectrum, uh, politically speaking, that would be resisting us and what we're doing. Right. And so by being unincorporated church under the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, uh, doing this work, and then the, the, the organization itself is an integrated auxiliary of said church, but it is its own 501c3. So that's what's interesting about this. Legacy Housing has its own board of directors, its own 501c3, its own organization, but it comes under the umbrella and therefore receives the religious protections that a church would have. So people wonder, like, why would you put it under the church? I actually want it to have that religious protection uh, yeah. literally on the books. And so, no, I don't believe we should be doing things conventionally exactly the same way that the world does. So we've done that. Uh, we've planted two homes, like I said, uh, in Volusia County, and we now are helping other homes plant in Jacksonville. Uh, our daughter's house in Texas already exists. They've been running for a few years now. And then Canton, Missouri, uh, at the Sun Valley Youth Ranch, also has legacy houses on site uh, that we are helping them to um, take in young ladies who are aging out of care. And what's amazing is this year, we just bought the first boys' home. So my wife and I are going to be house parenting this home. We house parented the girls home for the first two years, brought on a house parent who's been with us since, and then we'll be house parenting the boys home so that we get our feet wet with serving the male demographic and, and uh, discipling them uh, a little bit differently than the girls. Cause even biblically there are, you know, roles for the sexes. And, and yeah. so there's a different uh, type of discipleship for both groups. And so we'll be discipling the men, helping them to be good husbands, fathers, and providers. And, and that's yeah. really our goal. Um, and you mentioned something earlier, Richard, and, and as we wrap it up, I, I just figured we could mention this, but you mentioned just that uh, we're, we're not seeing as much practice in the Christian church. Uh, we, we might even have really solid theology, like our doctrine might be great, again, you know, remembering the Good Samaritan story, like we might have pretty good theology. I mean, even Jesus said about the Pharisees, like, listen to everything they teach you but don't do what they do. You know, <laughs> like, yeah. they're, they're um, right. As far as doctrinally speaking, yeah. they're right. You know, so, mm. but, but don't be like them because they pass by. They don't actually help. They just, they're orthodoxy, not orthopraxy. And something I see in Acts chapter two and Acts chapter four um, is that after the believers repent of their sins and believe in Jesus Christ and are baptized in the name of the father, son, and the spirit, 
uh, and Peter specifically or explicitly says in the name of Jesus Christ. Um, what was the follow up? You know, and yeah. and and I just want to read that really quick because sure. this had a profound effect on us too. Like, what even when we planted Ormond Church, like, what is the church supposed to be? Like, where's our blueprint? Well, we can't necessarily use another church, even a modern one, as our blueprint. All these church planters are using other churches and what they're doing as their blueprint. We we really need to get back to it is written, sola yeah. scriptura. What do the scriptures say on how a church is supposed to be run? And so Acts two forty four. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were, were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day, those who are being saved. So according to scripture, the most effective church growth strategy I believe is in Acts 2 and Acts 4. And that is after salvation, um, you are dedicating yourself. In verse 42, it says they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. So you devote yourself to the scriptures and learning what the scriptures say. I mean, that that is, you are not going to progress as a Christian if you don't devote yourself to the scriptures. Like yeah. Jesus is the word made flesh. So you have to get into the scriptures. You need to know them. You need to be a Berean Jew, right? Acts 17 and 11. They were of more noble character because they searched the scriptures daily to see if what Paul said was true. Like search the scriptures. This is how you'll keep away from the wolves. This is how you'll end up in a biblical church. This is how you'll end up doing what's right even when your biblical church isn't doing what's right, right? Because mm. ultimately it's going to matter what you're doing. So sometimes people think, well, I got into a biblical church where they got orthodoxy. Yeah, but where's their orthopraxy, right? Like I, I've seen a lot of orthodox church that I would agree fundamentally yeah. with what they're saying, but what are they doing, right? Yeah. And then they ultimately were selling their possessions and giving to the poor and helping people. And then it says yeah. that God was adding to their number daily those who are being saved. And then the same is said in Acts 4, and this is, this is the last one so we can wrap this up. But in Acts chapter 4, the exact same thing, we see this blueprint again uh, in verse 32. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. For there was not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each as any had need." And so what I see in the blueprint of the first few chapters of Acts is that devotion to scripture is huge, right? We do want to be orthodox. And then devotion to practice of literally taking your possessions. I mean, it goes so far as to say they did not even consider their possessions to be their own anymore. In other words, you know, where your treasure is there, your heart will be. Like if you really love God, then whatever you own financially or assets or whatever, it's all God's now. Like you died to yourself, it's his and you distribute it as he tells you. And you got to trust him enough to know that as he commands you to distribute it and to share, that he's also going to provide for you still. I think if we let fear regulate our generosity, we will never give what God is telling us to give. We have mm. to be in faith. We have to trust in his provision and grace, and then we can go wild with it. And I'll tell yeah. you, the truth is, I do not have a large church. I'm not a mega church pastor. You know, I, I have a I have a decent um, online ministry, you know, on TikTok and YouTube, but but in person, small church, you know, I, I, I there's not a huge amount of funding coming in through the church. All of that. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't have all these yeah. resources that somebody might suspect like, oh, yeah, no, no, no. I when we dove in, I literally quit my job. Uh, with very little money in the bank, just trusting God, knowing that he told us. And what happened was in that faith, in stepping out, knowing that he wanted us to do this, within just a couple of months, people had given $50,000 to start that first house. So we started renting a house. We didn't even buy one. We just rented one and started taking in foster youth. And so you can start with where you're at and you do not have to be rich and wealthy. I believe that's why the tithe is meant to be a percentage rather than an amount. Right. No. Jesus wasn't impressed when the rich were throwing in their large mounts in the temple because he knew the percentage and it was probably less than 10 percent. Right. But the poor widow gave everything she had. That was 100 percent. And he was really pleased with that, even though it was a few coins. Mm. And so when we sit down and we really review our finances, we need to start at at least 10 percent. I mean, Abraham gave to Melchizedek and Jesus is in the order of Melchizedek because I've heard people argue against tithe because, oh, it's the law of Moses and all of that. I'm like, this is pretty mosaic. I mean, Abel was giving God 
a tithe. And that's why Cain killed him in it because his tithe was very good yeah. compared to, to Cain's. And so tithing and giving God a 10%, that's the beginning point. We should all be there. We should all be giving. And I mean to the church. Like I, when I say tithe, I mean to the church. And the church should be, this is why we are a church and then an integrated auxiliary. The church should be redistributing as Peter did to those who are in need within the church and then in the general community. And then at that point, I believe we're being biblical with our finances, both as individuals and as the church. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And uh, I love that. I mean, again, we could probably go for another hour or more. Um, but I think when two pastors are talking, it's pretty easy. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and something I'm passionate because, again, it, for me, and not to you know be convenient and say, well, I like this and I I have a passion for this too, but I know what stops me is either you know having companionship, companionship, a, a partnership with the either the church you're at or the church you're pastoring. Of course, now I pastor a church. I haven't. I'm not condemning anyone at the church uh, that I pastor, but sometimes you know you're going at it alone. Whether it's personal evangelism, whether it's a Bible study for you know, uh, or in your neighborhood or even just, Hey, let's do this new thing at church or yeah. let's start this new ministry or, or let's, let's just go help people or let's, amen. Yeah. Whatever, you know I mean? But sometimes people think, well, yeah, but what about, you know, <laughs> if you don't work, you don't eat. Yeah. yeah. How often do you right. In this particular doctrine and that particular thing, it's like, yeah. well, he's not <laughs> this or they're not that I'm not going to partner with them because they don't affirm right. these doctrines or, or, Oh, I totally. Yeah. What a, what a hindrance that. to the church. I, Obviously well, I get that uh, at the orthodoxy right. level. I understand like debate it out. I have no problem debating any topic with people, yeah. but at the orthopraxy level, it's pretty clear. Love thy neighbor is the same and define the same for all of us. And that is to, you know, do for others as you would do for yourself. So we feed, yeah. we clothe, you know, I, I'm reminded of Matthew 25 uh, and Jesus is, judging all nations that separating the sheep of the goats. He says, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty. and You gave me something to drink. Yeah. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick or in prison. And you visited me. I was a stranger and you invited me in. Right. So yeah. six things there. Six is the number of man. There's six earthly things that people who really love their neighbors were doing. And it actually defines who the real sheep and the goats were because right. they really loved it. So at the end of the day, I, I mean, are we even Christians if we don't believe like James one twenty seven or Matthew 25, like, Yes, we need to gather together as one Christian church. I don't even care. I literally don't care. Catholic, Orthodox, Anglican, Protestant, let's work together to serve the orphan, the widow, the fatherless, the stranger, the people that the Bible yeah. says, hey, do good deeds for these people. Yeah. And then when it comes to the Orthodox stuff, yeah, I'm, fi I'm totally fine with arguing that out. That's fine. But you got to understand that's orthodoxy. So yeah, we attend somewhere different because we believe a different orthodoxy system, right? We believe a different doctrinal system, but orthopraxy, that's the uniting force of the church. Like right. we can do, we do all believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and savior. You're not even Christian. If he, you don't believe he didn't die on the cross for sins and resurrected three days later. So that is agreed upon. I mean, by all universally, all Christians, and then orthopraxy, we do agree on as well. Like we yeah. should be doing this. The only maybe disagreement on orthopraxy, like I mentioned a moment ago, would be people who bring up, oh, you don't work, you don't eat. Well, okay. Contextually, that's specifically written to the person who's being lazy, not to right. the giver. That's not written to the giver. The giver is to be generous yeah. and to help the guy who's <laughs> suffering, right? The guy who's suffering needs to mature. And that's where the discipleship comes in. Like we don't just take in foster youth and just go, Hey, just enjoy, you know, um, all this wonderfulness, you know, this fake reality where everything's going to given be given to you on a silver platter. Right. It's while we help them, we're discipling them and teaching, Hey, you got to work. You got to, you got to provide, you've got to, you know, you got to be generous yourself. Even yeah. like the scriptures say, teach the thief to steal no more, but to work with his hands so that he may have something to share with those in need. Like yeah. that's part of the discipleship. And, but that doesn't mean I don't help the poor person or the thief or the person that's a drug addict until, you know, like I, I help them now and I teach them to help themselves at yeah. the same time. I think we see that sometimes even with salvation and things where some people, you know, if they're very Baptist, Baptistic or, you know, Bible church, you know, credo Baptist, oh, you got to believe this, then you got to produce fruit. And then it's like, probably, I think, I think little Timmy, you know, he's 10 now. He's, I think he's probably a Christian. It's like, well, I understand that because we don't want to like falsely baptize, but what does the scripture say? If, if you believe, well, the, does the kid believe? Well, right. Yeah. Is he the most mature Christian ever? Well, no. Does he still act like a 10 year old boy? Yeah. Like, and so there's like this level of like, well, where's the discipleship? Where's the Matthew 28 right. 
you know, disciple the nations and, you know, that talk of Christian nationalism, and that's a good talk to have. And, you know, I'm, I'm in favor of that as opposed to godless paganism or, you know, (laughs) globalist paganism. Sure. You have to pick a system of government. You're like, well, uh, the ideal was the one that God tried to get Israel to stick with, which was having right. literally God run Israel. Right. But then they wanted a king. So, yeah, OK, so you want to have a religious authority in, yeah. in a position. I have no problem with that. I don't know why people yeah. think that's a bad thing. I'm like, it's well, weird. A I, pagan running the country weird. is going to literally just behead us. I mean, eventually that's where Caesar gets. Yeah. Caesar gets to a point where he's like, yeah, let's put them in the games and watch animals eat them. Like, no, yeah. like I want a Christian authority, of course, you know. Sorry, go yeah, ahead. It's, <laughs> I, but I think, I think we so often, because I think of it myself, and if I'm thinking of it, I'm not unique likely, yeah. but I'll say it out loud because other people won't, is there's this either or. It's either yeah. this or it's this. It's either this or it's this. And yeah, there's plenty of binaries and plenty of either ors. Like you're either married to a wife or if you're a man or not like you're not like a married bachelor and these weird contradictions but there's this point of like you said with james yeah i'm a i'm a five pointer i'm a four pointer i believe in this premillennial this the you know i'm post millennial i'm a a young earth creationist da 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 da, all down the list i'm baptistic i you know i'm covenantal all these stuff great but like where does that go when you know, there is somebody, there's that guy on the street that's in need, or is that person in your congregation? And, or... and that's why I started there. I mean, the what? Good Samaritan yeah. is, is the perfect example of orthodoxy and orthopraxy. Like the orthodoxy guys didn't have the right orthopraxy. And yeah. so where we can agree is practice. We can yeah. agree on practice. I've actually found that. I, I found that. Okay, so I'll give an example. I know this is controversial, but we'll have Mormons that like to get involved. I'm not saying it at a large scale. I mean, it's mostly just your average Protestant Christians, but yeah. we'll have Mormons. Okay, so I fundamentally disagree with so many things in Mormonism. I will openly discuss my, discuss my disagreements, but at the end of the day, can we both serve orphans together? Yeah, we, we absolutely can. And yeah. at the same time, it actually gives me an opportunity to have conversations amicably about topics that Christians just shy away from. I mean, if you never interact with a Mormon because you're like, well, that's not real Christianity. Well, you're not, first off, you're, you're well, not going to be them able a to favor? witness. Yeah, <laughs> I know. You're not going to be able to witness. What about the gospel? You know? uh, but then let's, let's say yeah. it's something more common like uh, Calvinism and Arminianism. Uh, well, I, I'm a, a Molinist as far as I, I hold the doctrine of Molinism, which is – if the the quickest way I could explain it is it affirms both God's sovereignty over all events, which is why all prophecies will happen. And he ultimately will have all of his actions carried out and he is sovereign over everybody. Um, And then that he's bestowed free will. um, But in the midst of that free will still has people born in a time and a place and in a situation where they ultimately fulfill his will. Maybe the quickest and easiest example is Jonah, Jonah go to Nineveh and you know, Jonah says, no, I'm not going to Nineveh. Well, I believe Jonah's actually acting on his own free agency, yet God is sovereign, foreknew that he ultimately would go to Nineveh, fulfill what he wanted him to do, and God, without violating that free agency, gave him a real genuine choice that people think isn't, and he says, well, paraphrasing, but he says, go to Nineveh or die, essentially, is is the deal. Like, I'm not going to sustain your breath. (laughs) So, so, So he's still sovereign. Like, how sovereign is he where he's controlling free willed beings and they ultimately do what he wants, and they're still responsible because they did have genuine agency. I know that's a bigger topic. Okay, so People debate on that all day long. Like that is one that's pretty common. I hear it all the time. I've been in that conversation all the time. Molinism's the wild card of the of the three uh, less held, um, you know, theology. However, regardless of one's belief, man, I am so happy to work with, you know, uh, Wesleyans and and Calvinists, and and you know, I'm more than happy for all of us to work together and to help these, these orphans, because I think what the devil does is he really does get us to focus in on something like, I'm just picking that one sovereignty and free will. He'll really pick us and we'll get so heated about it. A little too, a little too upset about it. I mean, at the end of the day, no, a lot of people, and (laughs) and then we'll sever (laughs) in the comments. We'll see it right now. I know. And we'll sever our relationship with another believer over something that doesn't relate to soteriology anyways. Yeah, I know that. So- yes. OK. Sovereign's will and who he appoints and chooses to be saved. I get that that will apply in some degree. But at the end of the day, what is the outward in our temporal realm? What's the outward fruit what's that a person has believed? What are we right? told it, to do? They are. Be- they Has this person believed in Jesus Christ that he died and resurrected three days later? And have they been baptized in his name? If the answer to all of that is yes. And they believe the Bible is the infallible word of God and all, you know, yes, they are a Christian. OK, so what we believe on the other things. 
isn't going to matter as much as did we love our neighbors together? Like, were we part of that sheep group in Matthew 25? Yeah. So anyways, I'm just using that as an example. Like I'm, no, I'm more than happy to talk about gifts of the spirit and cessationism. Like I've yeah. nope. If you, if you go on my channel and I know you have some, you know, and, and even my TikTok, like I'm not shying away from what I believe on those topics. However, at the end of the day, my real goal at, even as a mini shepherd in the church, you know, just one of many voices that are trying to bring people to Christ is we really need to be loving our neighbors. I mean, anything less than what James 127 says is pure and undefiled. Anything less is impure and defiled. Yeah. I, I mean, that's like, that's a strong revelation that God gave me is, is, is it just clicked one day reading it. It's like, if you're not looking after orphans and widows, it's still impure. It's mm. still defiled. Mm. Even if you can perfectly articulate some profound scriptural knowledge, mm. you're still indifferent and passing by. You actually hate your neighbor because you didn't help them when they were in the ditch. That's the key. That's what matters. That's what the final judgment in Matthew 25 is all about. And I get it. Like some people are so perplexed why judgment day, the primary focus would be action when you're not saved by action. Well, the actions were the fruits of those who are genuinely saved, right? Mm. These were the, this was the outward expression of the genuine inward faith. Abraham was saved according to his faith, right? He was counted righteous mm -hmm. because of his faith. However, what did Abraham do? He circumcised himself. He went to the land. God told him he took Isaac to sacrifice him. He always walked in obedience. And so if we're walking in obedience, the first commandment should be loving our neighbor. That's the one we should, people should be able to see that in our lives. If you really have the faith of Abraham, you will also, and this is it. If you have the orthodoxy of Abraham, you'll have the orthopraxy of Abraham as well. That's what yeah. it comes down to. Yeah. No, this is a pleasure, brother. I appreciate it. I really do hope this Real is pleasure. Yeah. convicting and uh, encouraging for everybody. Uh, definitely reach out to Rich audience wise. Uh, please reach out to him and I'll put the descript the link in the descriptions and contact information as well. They're on TikTok, YouTube and uh, Twitter as well. So, I mean, you know, start small, like you said, and that's Amen. I mean, that's how anything else you're starting a house. You start one brick at a time after you, yeah. you know, flatten out the ground. OK, this is how you do it. It's not tomorrow. We have a whole house. You got to lay this foundation. You got to do the woodworking. You got to do yeah. the electrical, all this stuff. And it takes time. And I think a lot, of, a lot of times, probably in, in the last couple of decades, we've got such a microwavy type instant act. Yeah. That yeah. I'm not fully matured or she's not fully mature. Our, our marriage isn't perfect. My church isn't perfect. This isn't happening. I tried evangelizing that guy that one time and it didn't work. So whatever. Yeah. My kids yeah. are still disobedient on and right. on and on. And it's like, but we're building, right? I mean, the kingdom right. of God, I mean, Jesus says it's like mustard seed, right? It grows, it's small. Right. And then the birds of the air. Sanctification is a process. It's a lifetime yeah. process. Uh, you have to figure God's building blocks, uh, just using my life as an example. First, he saves me. Then he starts to teach me. Then I start to get involved with helping people who are in need. And then you're talking about, you know, after definitely over a decade, then we're doing like more serious work in the kingdom. Um, that's a long process. And I'm still yeah. learning. Uh you know, when we started the first home, that took at least two years to plant that mm -hmm. first home from the time we received just like revelation, you need to do this to actually having a home. And then to plant the boys home, I knew the Holy Spirit told me to plant a boys home in 2019. Mm -hmm. And it took mm -hmm. until uh, March of this year to wow. actually plant that boys home. So, you, and that's while doing the work. So you've, you, there's a level, this is what the scriptures say, through faith and patience, inherit the promises. Mm. Right. So you have to have this level of patience where you're waiting on God and trusting him and knowing that there's a lot of learning to be done during the process of ultimately fulfilling the call that he's given. And then during the call itself, there's a ton of learning to be done. Like I, we as Christians, we've got to stop being so arrogant and thinking we know it all, especially as we learn a little bit of what the Bible says or like, you know, we we read some Tacitus or whatever, like we, we read some history, you know, we learn a little history, we learn a little bit of Bible and then we're like, yeah, I'm super smart, you know, yeah. we, we, we got to recognize we're a student forever. Yeah, we are forever a student. We are forever being discipled. We're forever learning. And we don't attain perfection until the resurrection anyways. And mm. so during this process, 
don't be discouraged by the fact that there's a one, there's a lot of spiritual resistance because there's a real devil and he acts, he's a, like a lion, you know, roaming around seeking someone to devour. So there's real resistance. Um, and God gives you the grace to endure him and to have victory over him when he resists. Mm -hmm. But then there's also just a lot of experiences that we have to learn as we go. You might not know how to really take care of children who have gone through trauma, but the Holy Spirit does. And the Holy Spirit will also, one, teach you directly, two, teach you through experience, and three, will surround you with people who have some experience to help you. And so kind of in closing, I mean, that's what Legacy Housing is doing. We're planting, planting network homes. So if you feel led to do this, we can help you plant your own 51c3 and, you know, get a home going and, you know, help you learn how to fundraise, help you learn how to disciple these precious young kids mm -hmm. uh, as they're becoming adults. And we can really assist you with that. That's, that's our goal. And so you, there is support out there and we're continually growing. I mean, we can point you to homes we've already planted and they can help you as well. Like if you're in Texas, we would connect you with the home in Texas, for example. Yeah. Um, so don't, don't be afraid to step out in faith and do what God is telling you to do because he will always provide what's necessary. And in fact, I actually believe he purposefully puts us in situations where we do not have the ability to accomplish it on our own whether financially or emotionally or spiritually or, you know, whatever communally, we don't even have the communal support we need. I, I really believe he puts us in those positions on purpose so yeah. that we'll see him work. It, it makes me think of Gideon where God sent him in a battle with only 300 guys. He had tens of thousands originally, and he sends him in with only 300. And he says explicitly, well, I'm doing this so that Israel doesn't believe that, you know, you as Israel accomplished it, but they'll know that it was me who accomplished it on your behalf. And so I, yeah. I, I believe he still does that today. You know, you go in with your brave 300, it's not enough to win and yet you win anyways. Yeah, no, that's true. That's good. All right, everybody. Well, reach out to rich legacy housing, do something, right? We got to do something. Even, even if at the minimum start praying, you're yeah. feeling that way. You're looking at that and you're saying, how can I get more involved? Uh, they're going to definitely point you in that right direction. Maybe it's Amen. planning a house. Maybe it's maybe it's doing that thing. Maybe it's moving to one of these areas, learning the system, as it were, helping with that, or maybe it's just taking in some foster care. Yeah, uh, become a foster, a foster parent. Kid. There's a huge yeah. lack of foster parents. And then the people yeah. who are becoming right. foster parents, if they're not Christians, they really are the type who are like, well, let's transition this kid. Like they'll adopt kids and they're like, let's transition them. Or they're, they're teaching them. Uh, really just pagan and, and godless yeah. ideologies. So we, we need Christians to be raising these kids because if, if you understand homosexuality just on a biological level, you, you cannot reproduce as a homosexual. So yeah. oftentimes they're, they're actually a pretty uh, statistically large demographic that's adopting and fostering. Yeah. So we need to make sure that these kids aren't getting sucked into that at such a young age when they really don't understand the gravity of what's being taught to them so there's yeah. there's a lot of reasons to get involved here you know <laughs> everything's tied no. in it's so true and that again that goes back to doctrine right that goes back to yeah. theology that goes back to who god is that goes back to who man is what are we doing here what's our responsibility etc so amen this is good brother i appreciate it everybody thank you pastor helpful. yeah, yeah. No, thank you i didn't I, I actually didn't know you were a pastor originally so also pastor rich thank you brother i hope it was helpful for everyone and uh, have a great day. God bless. Amen. Love you guys. The Lord bless you.